Hi, I'm Elaine Toon. Thanks for coming to worship at Southland today. We've been feeling badly that no one has greeted you the past few weeks when you've tuned in for our live stream worship. So I'm here to say, I'm so glad you're here. Before we start, I want to tell you about a few things that Southland is doing as we all continue to stay home and stay safe. Yesterday, we had our first drive through food collection for the refuge. Many people in our community are really in need of food right now, so thanks to everyone who donated. We will continue receiving non-expired food donations next Saturday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. right under the main entrance portico in the north parking lot. Just leave the food in your back seat or trunk and our team will remove it all for you. We promise to stay a safe distance away. Thanks again for coming. After today's service, my good friend Jeff Griffith will have a couple more things to say before you leave. So stick around for a few minutes to hear from him. Thanks again for coming. Enjoy the service. We are glad that you're here this morning. Wherever you're at, I invite you to stand or sit, but I do want you to sing along with us. And let's worship God, even though I know we're a long way away from each other. I know God is near, and he wants to hear your voice sing to him. So let's sing together. Let's worship together.
Try 
There's a scripture in the book of John that I want to share with you. It simply says this. It says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be children of God. My friends, that's an amazing concept that God has called us and we are his children. I want you to sing this song with confidence, knowing he loves us.
Some people may wonder if it's true. Just stories, myths, fairy tales. And it's just a book, a way to control the simple-minded. But only those who don't think would follow so blindly. That if there's no proof, there's no resurrection. But here's the thing. There's more than one way to know something's true. Not because a book says it. Not because of a whim or misplaced trust. There's no physical evidence of love. How can I prove joy? I will never convince you that I was once blind, but now I see. Because I've seen the resurrection. I've seen it in a mother's comfort. I've heard it in my child's laughter. I've felt it in an embrace. I've tasted it when I enjoy a meal with friends. The resurrection isn't just something that happened 2,000 years ago. It's something that happens every time we choose family over work. Every time we choose to serve. Every time we sing that song, or we tell that story, or a life is transformed. That is why we gather. That is why we sing. That is resurrection. Hey, good morning, Southland. I mean, we're so glad that you're here today joining us for The Well. And, and you know, it's seriously, I, I'm, I'm celebrating today. It's, it's actually Palm Sunday where we reflect on the story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a colt, a donkey, and everyone's dropping palm branches or cloaks on the ground so that he didn't have to walk in the dirt. And it's a day that we're supposed to be thinking about hallelujahs and celebrating and lifting up Christ. And yet here we are in the midst of what we're going through. And I think to myself simply the question, how are you? I mean, I could hear you, I really could. In my mind, I could hear you singing in your living room. I could hear you praying. I could hear you enjoying worship together. But I know each day uh, seems to labor on. And so the question is, how are you doing? How are you doing with the isolation, with the separation, with bored kids that you're trying to just keep uh, active and interested? How are you doing with going to the grocery store and having people run away from you like you have the plague because you might have the plague? Uh, this is not an, an easy time for us. And, and, and I guess the, the, the real question is, is your heart and mind ready for things to get worse? Because when you think about it, that's what all of the news, all of the government is telling us, that this thing is going to get worse. That in America, we may see anywhere between 100,000 and 240,000 deaths. And that's hard to wrap my head around. And, and, it, and it, it's at times like this when things are tough, sad, tragic, unjust, that our faith can be absolutely rocked to the core. And, and it's interesting where not only in a, in a situation like this, but in any tough time that you go through, you could begin asking the question, where is God in all of this? Where are you, Lord? And as we, as we go through this Easter series together, Rise, that's really the main point. That no matter the difficulty in life, whether it's the shame or hurt from our own past or our present reality that we're going through, we can rise above it because of Jesus' resurrection. Not just something we celebrate that happened in the past, not just something that's promised for us in the future, but we can rise above it in the present reality 
of difficult circumstances. You know, what's interesting is I prepared these series topics a couple months ago. And this day when we talk about rising from doubt, I mean, it couldn't be a better time. And yet I have to admit to you, I'm just not surprised at all that God chose it for this moment. And, and, and this is where I want to take you to a few places in Matthew's gospel account of Jesus' life. And so if you have a Bible or you can find the Bible on your device, we're going to go to Matthew starting with chapter 8 today. And, and let me give you a little background as you're looking for it. Um, you may not know this, but Matthew, the gospel was written primarily to Jewish people to show them that all of the things that the prophets forecasted hundreds of years before have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so he lays out for them a lot of scripture uh, that they had already known and how it was fulfilled in the life of Jesus. And, and it's interesting that he provides all of this evidence that Jesus was who he said he was. And yet we read in the stories that he shares that even sometimes his closest followers, his disciples, had trouble believing. They doubted. And when things got scary, they often forgot what they had already experienced. And, and that's what brings us to this uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, where they're, they're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. They're in a boat with Jesus, and here's what happens. Verse 23, chapter 8 of Matthew. Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples, and suddenly a terrible storm came up with waves breaking into the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. And the disciples went to him and woke him up shouting, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. Now, if there's anything that danger and disappointment or disaster can do, it's create doubt. Now, now fortunately, we have something the disciples didn't have when they were in the boat. We have the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, now, I've got a couple things about how this resurrection of Jesus helps us to rise above circumstances when we doubt. You see, here's the first thing I want to encourage you with today, that you can rise from doubt's deception, the lies that doubt brings into your mind and ultimately then your heart. I mean, what is doubt anyway? But questioning something that you've always believed is true or good or best or right. I mean, example would be something like this. Well, because God is good, then my life should always be comfortable or happy. That nothing bad or unjust should ever happen. That's a deception. And we can believe many things about the Lord, but our faith is rocked when we face struggle. That's what's happening in this sailing story that we read this morning. I mean, up to this point, Jesus has been doing all these miracles. He's had huge crowds gathering around him to hear his teaching. They've loved it as Jesus has brought truth into the hypocritical lives of the religious leaders. All these good things are happening. Jesus is so good. He's my savior. He's everything I need for this life. He's letting me live my best life now. Yeah. I mean, I mean then the storm hits. But, but wait, it's okay. Jesus is in my boat, so it's all good until it isn't. And I begin to focus on my storm. And my friends and family begin to focus on the storm or my storm. And even my dog knows that I'm in a storm. And I may start to wonder, is God real? Is he actually there? And if he is here, is he loving? Does he know my situation? Does he care about me at all? I mean, it's his job description, right? To keep me happy, happy and safe. And so if I'm not, perhaps he's not. You see, that's doubt's deception. Hard times come and we forget everything in the Bible narrative. And worse yet, we forget everything in our own experience that we've had with Christ up to that moment. I mean, men and women get this. The world is fallen. 
Start back in Genesis, you can read it all the way through. The world is fallen, so pain happens. Storms happen. Even plagues happen. You know, Jesus is asleep in the boat, relaxing because God doesn't worry about storms, even though they are real, and even though they can be difficult. And the disciples view, here he is, Lord, save us, and they emphatically state it, we are going to drown. I mean, they've already made up their mind. Now, it's interesting that's doubt's default, that we're in a storm and therefore bad things are about to happen. And we will experience perhaps even our ultimate fear, death. And who isn't going through that wonder right now? Their ability to navigate the storm with Jesus in the boat was adversely impacted by the deception of their misunderstanding of who he really was and who was there to save them. Now, again, I want to talk about the context of the story because Jesus had been healing people, performing many miracles, and this is the guy in your boat. And it's as if they had totally forgotten in this moment all that he had done so that they could relax, so that they could watch him do his work. And and honestly, that's what this COVID-19 crisis is causing me to see in the lives of people that I know and love. Because people who have no hope that are in my life, they have no faith, and they're having a very difficult time navigating the fear that comes from this pandemic. And, And we should absolutely take every precaution that we're being told to take because we love one another. I mean, you see a few people here on Sunday morning who've, who've gathered so that you could worship on Sunday as you normally do, and I'm grateful for them. But listen, we're all staying very far apart from each other, and our conversations are a, a, across a not very crowded room. And, and it's because we care about each other. We should do that. We don't go out and create suffering. We try our best to avoid it and mitigate it. But even some who have put their faith in Jesus have forgotten his power and promises where he says, I will be with you. So some now even doubt. Some who put their faith in Christ now say, well, you know, God isn't supposed to allow this kind of suffering, is he? I mean, if God was loving, these kind of things wouldn't be happening, would they? And that's doubt's deception that for, for somehow a storm means that God isn't who I thought he was. And, and I give the disciples credit. I mean, let's face it. As the storm came up, they assumed Jesus could do something about it. So they said, save us. I mean, they, they cried out to him for that. But I know, and, and I get it, a raging storm doesn't mean that you're just all chill about it. Like, uh, Jesus, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but... There's a storm happening. It's pretty awesome. It's kind of cool. But I'm pretty sure if something doesn't happen pretty quick, we're all going to drown. That's not how we face crisis. I get it. A lot of us cry and scream and call out. Yet it's that's just the kind of point that I'm trying to make here and the kind of point Matthew's making by telling us the story is that we have to remember who is in the boat. And we can be confident, confident, because we don't have to be deceived by doubt. He does care, and he will save if we'll simply ask him to. We're given the opportunity in every crisis in our life to put our faith to work. You see, doubt can grow then from our thoughts and what we're believing about him, people tripping us up all the time, and, and, and they, can, they can go from our thoughts to our feelings. And that ultimately then is, is what motivates or, or we act on in terms of our behavior. So, so let me share a second sailing in a storm story in Matthew's gospel. Fast forward to Matthew chapter 14 and, and jump down to verse 22. And then as you're going there, let me give you the, the context here. Jesus has just been um, preaching to everyone, and, and there are thousands on a hillside, and 
The Bible tells us that Jesus performs a miracle so that all 5,000 people who are there could be fed. It was probably even more than 5,000. And it was all fed through the lunch of a little boy who showed up with a few loaves and some fish. And, and Jesus performs this miracle. They're even gathering food after it was all over. And so now Jesus is trying to clean up after the picnic. He, he sends his disciples in a boat out on the lake to go to the other side, and he's having everybody clean up and go home uh, after the, the, the service, after his message. And, and it's interesting because he tells his disciples to get in a boat that he knows, as God, is about to go through a storm, but they have no idea. You see, this part of the world is very low, 600 plus feet under sea level, and, and then it has hills and mountains around it, and so it's very unpredictable in terms of the weather. And of course, they didn't have our weather technology, so they had no idea. They're in the boat, it's late at night, and a big storm comes up. And, and it's interesting, it says they, it was so bad, they were fighting the waves. I mean, doing everything that they could do to keep this ship afloat. And suddenly, they see Jesus walking on the water. Although in the midst of the storm, I mean, rain going sideways, wind and waves everywhere, they see this figure and they don't know who he is. But Matthew says they actually think he's a ghost. And so Jesus identifies himself. And, and Peter yells out to him, Lord, if it really is you, tell me to come to you. And, and literally the translation is this. Jesus says, come on. And that's what he tells Peter to do. And, and then this is where we pick up the story. Of chapter 14, verse 29, here's what happens. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he looked around at the high waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. And instantly, Jesus reached out his hand and grabbed him. Now, here's the thing. Not only can our, 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 our doubts rise up and deceive us, but our doubts can rise up and discourage us. We want to rise up and defeat doubts' discouragement. Because essentially, discouragement, exponentially, discouragement on steroids is what Peter was experiencing in this moment. This is where doubt moves from the head to the heart. The story starts out pretty well. Everybody does what they're supposed to do. They get in the boat, off they go, and the storms come up and they fight the waves like sailors do. The turn comes when they see this figure approaching them on the water and think it's a ghost. Now, once Jesus identifies himself, Peter wants proof that it's him. Now, who wouldn't be proud of Peter at this moment? for actually stepping out onto the water as Jesus says, come on. I mean, I'm pretty proud of him. But here's the thing, though. We can all jump in being thrilled by this new revelation that Jesus is real, that he loves me, that he's my savior. But, but remember, the first step is not the last step. And there will be many steps along the way in this faith journey that you have with Jesus Christ. And so you will take many steps on tough, tough, tough soil situations. You'll be walking on huge waves in your life, like we're all walking now. And, and maybe Peter thought jumping in would be enough. You know, he expects Jesus to calm the waters just like he did the first time that we read back in Matthew chapter 8. I mean, this is what Peter's thinking, you know, or if it is you, I'll step out and walk toward you. He expects to step out, and all of a sudden, the water's like glass, but that's not what happened. I mean, Jesus let the storm continue. Jesus let the waves continue to be huge around Peter, and maybe he didn't doubt in his head when he first stepped out. But now the troubled waters have perhaps not caused him to doubt Jesus, but to doubt the decision that he just made to go after him in a storm. Now, taking a step of faith, men and women, and not seeing the storm die down as he expected, he becomes very discouraged and loses his focus in that moment. Wait, 
he calmed the first storm. What's up with this? I mean, maybe this isn't Jesus. Maybe I shouldn't have jumped. Wow, this is pretty disappointing that I'm sinking in the water right now. And and again, doubt creates this discouragement because our feeling is that life should be comfortable when we're following God, that there shouldn't be storms and waves in our life. Circumstances discourage our spirit and rock us to the core of our faith. And this is the beauty of Jesus' response to Peter. He reached out his hand in this moment where he lost his focus, he was discouraged, he was sinking. He reached out his hand and he grabbed him, it said. And the truth is, men and women, that's what he's doing right now in this moment with this message and this word for you. If in the midst of all of this fear and crisis, you've had any doubts at all, he prepared this moment for you to be encouraged that he has you. He's grabbing you. You can trust him in this moment. You can set aside all of that doubt and all of the reasons that you might have been deceived in this moment because he's there to encourage you or to use Peter's words and the disciples' words to save you in this moment. You know, it's, it, it's interesting. I've, I've, I've been there many times where people have exactly the same response and yet different responses to things like illness and death. Uh, The first group of people have these questions and frustrations, and and then it just causes them to say, God isn't real, he doesn't care, and they go from God. They run away from God. But then there's the second group who also have questions. They also have frustrations. But those questions and frustrations don't cause them to run from God. They cause them to run to God, to find answers, to find strength, to find encouragement. You see... Suffering and struggle and even death itself shouldn't surprise us. The Bible story has told us from the very beginning in Genesis why this thing exists called suffering. It's because the world is fallen. But listen, it doesn't mean we have to be incapacitated by our doubt or our suffering, or our struggle. It can cause us to run to the God who loves us and has provided us hope through the resurrection of Jesus. Actually, suffering, crisis, provides you an opportunity. Now, to me, here's where Jesus is taking us. He's ultimately taking us to the question he asked to Peter that all of us need to answer. Look at it. In Matthew 14, verse 31, the second half there, we're just going to pick up where we left off. You don't have much faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. And then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. You see, here's here's what he's trying to help you uh, get to in in your application of all of this, is that you move from the deception of doubt into the discouragement of doubt, and you can be destroyed, or you can see that God is true and real in the midst of the crisis, and you can be encouraged by the fact that he's reaching out and grabbing you and holding you in this moment, and you can rise from doubt's destruction. You can destroy doubt in your life and all of its influence on your feelings and behavior. I mean, it's, it's like Jesus is saying to him, you've seen me work, guys. You've seen what I've done before. You've even been through a storm in a boat with me before and what happened. I saved you. Look, you can trust me. And if I tell you to walk on water, I'm telling you, you can do it. The big question is, hey, Why did you ever doubt me? Why would you question my care? I mean, I think it's a great question when he has proven himself over and over. Now, you know, he proves himself in a lot of ways. I mean, scholars over and over again have validated the biblical story. I mean, experts have showed us the truth of how the resurrection really did happen. 
and the Christian faith and the church throughout the last couple thousand years has powerfully and positively impacted the world for good. And even miracles still happen. And, and your personal experience with him is there. And a key statement in the story. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the son of God. <laughs> it's interesting, when you look at the language there, uh, in, in the original language, it's like, not, not just a statement, you're the son of God. But no, no, we get it now. You really are the son of God. It's like, well, you know, I've been doing a lot of stuff with you over the last couple of years. Can, are you just now understanding this? See, once again, the evidence came to them in their experience with him. Now, we believe first because we have the revelation of truth, this word that we read, and, and God uses it and speaks it to our heart. And that's the second part of how we believe, because he puts within us his spirit so that we can embrace all of this as true and good and right and best and his design for us and the human race. Now, see, I, I was really intrigued this week uh, as, as I'm listening to all of the news and the numbers are just horrific. Uh, a young leader, 19 years old, out of Beirut, Lebanon, sent me a message this week, and she said, Pastor Steve, I just want to know what you're thinking about all of this. She, she said, Ingrid is her name. Ingrid said, here's what I'm doing. She said, I'm, I'm using it to, to draw closer to God and I'm examining my life, and I'm repenting of any sin in my life, and, and I'm using this opportunity to tell my friends, to spread the good news to my friends. You see, Ingrid isn't incapacitated by fear and doubt. Ingrid is rising up and seeing this as an opportunity. Now, you know I wrote her back, and I was just affirming. She had a great three-point outline there. Everything that she said was exactly how a believer can be responding to this. And, and, and she's not discouraged because she recognizes that this could be her generation's opportunity in history to point people to the truth and love of Jesus Christ. I want Ingrid's faith. You see, but Jesus fully understands our spiritual struggle to trust him in difficulty, and that's why right now, in this moment, as maybe he sees you sinking into the waves of doubt, he's reaching out to grab you and pull you out of that and say, you know, you don't need to doubt. You can trust me. And if you're doubting God's presence and purpose in your life and in the world because of this pandemic, or maybe even other serious issues in your life. You feel like your faith is sinking in this moment of discouragement by the staggering numbers or the overwhelming re realities of life that you're going through. He is reaching out to you with a reminder to move you from doubt's deception and doubt's discouragement to doubt's destruction under his feet. You can destroy doubt. Now, let me just give you a couple practical ways, a few practical ways that you can do that. Here, here's the first one. It, it's to remember where you, what you believed in the first place, why you believed in the first place. I mean, what was it that ultimately drew you to Jesus? And then secondly, read God's word. Because let me tell you, there, is, there are a lot of messages out there attacking your faith in this moment, attacking the very reality of Jesus himself and us following him. I mean, there's a New York Times editorial this past week that was all about how the coronas is to be blamed upon evangelical Christians, the spread of the disease. It, it, it's unbelievable how those kind of attacks can begin to destroy you and tear you down because some national media outlet tells us that it's our fault. He says, no, 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 read God's word so you can counter all of that. Talk to God about it because I'm just going to tell you, he loves your questions. Loves them. Bring your questions to him. Be honest about your doubt and call out to him for, for help in that moment. Save me in this, Lord. Answer my questions. Show me that you're real, that you care, that, I, that I'm just being overwhelmed by this moment. 
and then ultimately talk to strong believers in your life who can encourage you, who will listen to you, who maybe can, can a- help answer some of those questions and be God's voice, a conduit of God's word into your life. I mean, surround yourself with that kind of proactive response to the doubt you may have because we're going through such a difficult time. You know, I get it. You know, we've all got questions. You've got questions. Good. Ask them. And then seriously, honestly, listen for the answers that God has for you in this moment. And let truth not the lies, not the deceptions, not the circumstances. Let truth encourage you. Rise from doubt. He gave you one big, well, one huge reason that you can. The resurrection. The thing is, the tomb is empty, and he's showing you today that he can be trusted because of the truth of what he did in history and the truth what he's doing now. You can rise from doubt. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I believe. I pray you would help my unbelief. In moments of struggle and difficulty and pain and suffering, I pray that you would help me run to you with my hand up saying, Lord, save me instead of running from you, believing that somehow you're not there. You forgive us when we've allowed this world's voice to be louder than your voice of truth and love. Lord, I pray in this moment right now for every person who might be watching this in their office, on their phone, in their living room. I pray that you would help them right now in this moment to find your strength, your voice, your help in these moments of doubt. Show each one you are true and real. And Lord, we pray you would invade our spirits with your spirit so we could find hope and encouragement. And we could be on Ingrid's team, Lord. Help us to look to you for encouragement. Show us where we need to repent of sin. And help us with every avenue we have to spread this good news to others. Lord, help us rise from doubt. And you take a minute right now, you pray your own prayer, and you ask God to help you through your struggles emotionally and mentally as we walk through this together. And say, Lord, help my unbelief. Help me through my doubt. You pray. You respond to what you've heard this morning. thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this word that reminds us that we're not just existing on this planet all alone, but you are here with us, walking with us through every storm of life. And now, Lord, hear our prayers and our song, and as we sing it to you, as we pray to you, we ask that you would remind us today that you are indeed our living We'll thank you for the work you do in us. In the wonderful, saving, resurrected name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, wherever you are, stand up right now and join our team and sing it out on this song. Give 
is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope, who could imagine so great a mercy, my heart could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of calls me His own. Beautiful Savior. Yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living. Name. Amen. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Christ, my living God. Amen. Lift it up again. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living Feel the promise Your buried body Began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declare the grave Has no claim on me Then came the morning That sealed the promise your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. This is the promise that Christ gives to us, that we don't have to worry about death in the grave. We've triumphed over it already because he's risen. And he can help us walk through, navigate through these crises together because of that reality. Now, maybe something that was said or sung or prayed today has, has caused you to want to talk to somebody and and you can email us a, a question or, or call. And after the service, uh, stick around just for a minute because Jeff Griffith is going to give you some information on how you can respond further and have people help uh, you walk through this storm together. Uh, also, we want to say thank you so much 
for the way you've given to us. And we're grateful for your offerings. And we ask you to continue to give either through the website, uh, texting or, or mailing it in. And we're so grateful for the generosity of Southland to keep our ministry going strong. And, uh, and, and thank you for, for the way you give generously to all that we're doing. Uh, one more thing is uh, that you, we sent out an email starting today. It's Holy Week, and every day there will be a devotion in your email box. If you didn't get it, check your junk file first. And then if it's not there, then just contact us through the website. You can go to About and Contact. And let us know that you'd like to be on the email list so that you'll get a daily devotion every day this week leading up to Easter. And of course, we're looking forward to our Easter celebration next week. And we hope that you'll invite people along with you uh, to, to, to celebrate the resurrection of Christ together. Uh, why don't you bow your heads with me as we close in prayer. Father, thanks so much for this day. And thanks for the reality that you have risen. And we do not need to fear what's before us. You are our hope. You are our help. And we pray you'll use us to communicate that to the rest of the world, to every friend in our life. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Stick around and listen to Jeff. Thanks a lot for being with us today. Hey, I'm Jeff Griffith. Thanks a lot for being at Southland today. Hope you enjoyed the service and were encouraged by the worship and Pastor Steve's message. Man, I know that I needed the reminder that doubt does not have to defeat me. If you'd like to talk with someone, people are ready to help. You can reach us by posting a message now if you're watching on Facebook, or click the prayer request button in the bottom right corner if you're watching through the website. You can also email Pastor Steve at the email address now on your screen with any questions you might have about his message today. If you need someone to pray with you, please text PRAYER to 317-400-2496, and someone will get back with you right away. Okay, a couple quick more mentions. We want all middle school and high school students to know you can stay connected. Tonight at 545, our teens will gather on Zoom. Text Pastor Nate at the number on your screen if you need the connection code. Also, our children's ministry is uploading weekly Bible teaching for children. Go to YouTube and search for Southland Church. You'll find the latest video from Miss Stephanie for kids to learn and enjoy. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell so you get notifications when new content is uploaded. By the way, that same YouTube channel is where you can find weekly updates from Pastor Steve as to how Southland is connecting, teaching, and serving our community. So everyone should subscribe to hear from him. Thanks again for coming. Be sure to tell all your friends about Southland's online worship. People are searching for help from God, and we want to do everything we can to encourage. Hope you'll join us next week.